It's been quite some time since I last did a TDU2 video on the channel, and what better way to jump back into it for this particular review than with one of, I would say, the sleeper best cars in the game, within its category at least, and of course, from one of my favourite manufacturers. Now, Spiker, for those who don't know, and a slight side note, have recently technically gone bankrupt, unfortunately. Not too surprising for a company like them during the current world times. But they're not technically gone, they're in more of a grey area where they still exist, the owner still has all the rights, they're just trying to secure more funding for future vehicles. And when it comes to TDU2, I would actually strongly argue, in fact, that this may well be the best racing game we've ever had for a Spiker fan. Because not only is the amount of Spikers in this game really good compared to most, I mean, anything more than one is generally pretty good. Forza has a couple, Gran Turismo had one. This game has, what, three, four of them? That's a pretty nice selection to have. And if you count the first game as well, it actually goes up even more because there were a couple of models in TDU1 which aren't even in the second game. So Spiker actually has a pretty strong showing in the Test Drive franchise and Actually, they're treated with a huge amount of respect, and of course you'll have seen that in my review of the D8. Now that is a very controversially styled SUV concept, but it's actually my favourite Spiker, and it's my second favourite concept car of all time in fact, and one of the plans that Spiker recently had in real life was actually to begin production on that car, and I think that's an excellent choice. It, it was a car that was too far ahead of its time, but that's for another video, and I already did that video. This time we're talking about the Aleron. Now the only unfortunate thing about the Aleron is that unlike the two other major spikers in this game, the Zagato and the D8, those two are overtly good, especially the D8. It's essentially the best SUV in the game, if you don't count, of course, the buggy, which you can't really use that much anyway. In the case of the Zagato, it's not the fastest thing around, but it's a very good supercar. This one could easily be overlooked because, for a start, it's in the A3 category. So it's not a top-tier machine, it's not the cheapest in the category, it doesn't have the most power, and it's not necessarily even the fastest. But, I would say, it could well be one of the best all-round choices of A3 car. And the reasoning on why I would say that is actually very simple. It's not just a straight-line machine, it's not just a cornering machine, it's not just very expensive or very cheap. It's actually got a good mix of everything. See, the engine in this one is a 4.2-litre V8, of course, mid-mounted, rear-wheel drive. It's only got 400 horsepower, which is nowhere near the highest in this class. For example, something such as the Mercedes CLK Black Series has way more power than that, over 500. In fact, that's one of the highest in this category. It's not even particularly higher than something like the Roof RK, which is a little bit lighter, of course, Porsche-based. That has 420 horsepower. Now, this really compares well in terms of what it can do with that power. Because even though it's not the lightest, of course a Catrum, for example, is even lighter in the category, but 3,100 pounds, or just over, is still very good. That's really light. And the results are, with 400 horsepower and that weight, coupled with, of course, everything else, the performance is really good. Stock, it does 0-60 to in 4.3 seconds, and it tops out at 186 miles an hour. So in other words, even though the power isn't the highest thing in the category, the performance is actually very good. And unlike some of the others, it doesn't drop in any particular way. So for instance, something like a Catrum has fantastic acceleration, but not so much top speed. The Mercedes is a straight line missile, but maybe a little bit too slippery or playful through corners. The Spiker has none of that, it's everything. It's got fantastic handling, really good acceleration, the top speed is more than good enough for most of the time. The only disadvantage really is that because it has 400 horsepower, it takes a little bit longer to get to that top speed. So yes, it is that fast, but there are a couple of other cars which could get there quicker. I would say the real selling point on the Spiker though, with its $180,000 price tag in the game, is the handling and specifically the manners. The way this car feels, the way it acts and performs through corners, it's a pleasure to work with. It's like the car knows what you want it to do. It never really surprises you. It's got so much grip. The handling is super smooth, really forgiving, which you probably wouldn't expect from a company like Spiker. They don't seem like a company who would even care if the car is good through corners because bespoke companies tend to be a little bit oddball and crazy in terms of how they turn out like. Not the case here. In fact, the way the car performs essentially feels like what you'd want from something like an Audi R8. 
very similar, in fact. And of course, Spyker have used Audi engines, so there's not too much of a surprise there in terms of some crossover of personality, but that's, again, kind of why I like it. It combines, in a similar way to what Pagani does, with Italian style mated to German tech, well, in a similar way, Spyker has mated this gothic, crazy interior and exterior design with actually some pretty solid power plants and tech and engineering. And even though, of course, in real life, they are among the most expensive cars in their category. I mean, six figures for a car that is essentially no quicker than a Corvette is a lot of money. But in real life, you're paying for more than just the performance. In the game, 180 grand is nothing. You can get that in no time at all. So. Even if you don't use the Spiker all the time, I would actually strongly recommend looking into getting one, because it's a really good all-round choice of A3 category car. It's one of my personal favourites anyway, so of course, being a massive Spiker fan, I'm glad that it's good in the game because, as I said earlier on in the video, they treat Spikers with a lot of respect in TDU2. In fact, more so than in the first game. In the first game they're pretty good, but you never really need to use them. In this game, well, the D8, the Aleron, the Zagato, they all offer a lot to love. Overall though, that's it on my thoughts for the Aleron in this specific game, and I have actually talked about the Aleron before. I believe uh, sometime last year, I think it was, I reviewed the Aleron in Forza Motorsport 4 as well. So if you are a fan of the car, be sure to check that one out. And of course, stick around on the channel for more test drive content. And of course, when TDU Solar Crown comes out, I will be featuring that as well. And I'm pretty excited to see what kind of car lineup we get in that game. But overall, that's it for this vid. Of course, I'll see you next time. And for now, as always, thanks for watching.